Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome uh, to our service this morning. Please remember there's a cup of tea afterwards in the hall behind me here, uh, so if you're not able to stay for a cuppa afterwards, it would be good to catch up with you. Uh, if you've got a bulletin on the way in, just to highlight a few bits and pieces, Presbyteries on on Tuesday. Uh, I should try and remember to put that on uh, every month because Presbytery is an open court. It's in public. Anybody who wants to attend uh, can do so. It's in the Free Church in Barora on Tuesday night, half past seven. Wednesday night, third Wednesday of the month. So that's the Wednesday when we come together, both ends of the congregation. This month that's in Tain, and we're going to have an AGM uh, on Wednesday night. Uh, very often we don't get a great turnout at our AGM. A lot of folk aren't interested in figures, but it's not just about the figures. We usually have a report from a few people of uh, just some of the stuff that's going on in the church that maybe you don't hear about. So I'd encourage you to come along uh, on Wednesday night. There are copies of the accounts, the, the simple bit of the accounts uh, at the door. If you didn't get one on the way in, you can pick one up on the way out. So it's Wednesday night, half past seven in the church in Tain. And uh, the community market, so we have a stall at the community market in Tain this coming Saturday, uh, that's to raise funds for the new church. So if you're able to bake or if you're able to help out on the day, uh, speak to myself or let Mari know. And if you can do so uh, relatively soon, so we know what's coming in. Uh, so far, just out of interest, three quarters of those who have volunteered uh, to bake are over 80. Uh, so if there's any younger bakers in the congregation who can help with that, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Oh, one final thing which is not on here as well. Um, some of you may be aware we had a meeting on Thursday night with representatives of the Free Church Continuing to discuss the property in Port Mahomag. So that property in Port Mahomag is owned by the Free Church but has been occupied by the Free Church Continuing. Uh, so all I can say at this stage is the meeting was useful, it was constructive, uh, there, was, there was good dialogue, a good spirit, uh, we'll be reporting back to the Deacon's Court uh, next week and then go back uh, to the Free Church Continuing. And as soon as there's something to report, uh, we will let you know. And I, I think if anything's going to happen, any transfer of property or any sale of property or anything like that, uh, it will come to a congregational meeting. Uh, so you will have the chance uh, to ask questions and get information and vote uh, on that. That's my understanding anyway, that it will come to a congregational meeting. But we're grateful uh, for that first meeting and the spirit uh, of the dialogue that was there. Well, we're here to worship God. We're going to sing uh, from Psalm 84 on page 112. Sing Psalm's version of Psalm 84, page 112 in your blue psalm books. We're singing verses 1 to 7 of that psalm. How delightful are your dwellings. O Almighty Lord to me, for your courts my soul is yearning. In your house I long to be. Heart and flesh cry out aloud for the true and living God. Verses 1 to 7 of this psalm. If you're able, let's stand to sing.
Let's bow our heads. We'll close our eyes. We're going to speak to God in prayer. So let's do that. Father in heaven, we thank you today for the gift of life. We thank you for the ability to be here in church today. We've been singing uh, uh, there of increasing strength as we go on our journey with God. And yet, Lord, we know that for many, what they actually feel is that their strength and their vigor is decreasing. And yet, Lord, we know, we know that people can be weak physically and yet go on being strengthened spiritually by you. And so we pray that you would strengthen us today. We pray that you would refresh us uh, by your word through the Bible today, that we would have that same longing uh, that the psalmist had to be in the place where you have worshipped. He goes on to say that one day in your presence is better than a thousand days elsewhere. He would rather be on door duty in the house of God than be somewhere else. So give us today, Lord, that sense of appreciation of the blessing it is to be in church. Stir our hearts and to praise and to worship you today because you're worthy of all our praise. And bless young and old here today. Particularly, Lord, we, we, we want to pray for the children as their holidays uh, come to an end and as they uh, go back to school. Lord, may you protect them and keep them and be pleased to bless them for your own name's sake and for your glory. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, let me speak to the young ones for a wee moment. I had a birthday during the holidays. And I wonder if anyone can guess what I got for my birthday. So I'll give you a clue. It's what men tend to get when nobody can think of anything else to give them and, and they've got old, like me. What might they have given me for my birthday? Something not very exciting. Henry? Socks, yeah. Five pairs of socks. But not just any socks. So this is harder. These were special socks. They had something on the socks. Any ideas what might have been on the socks? Yes. I can't hear you. No, they weren't the days of the week. That would have been helpful, Henry. No, that would have been good as well, yeah. No, no. What used to be my favorite thing in the world? On you go. Percy pigs. Here's my socks. I was going to wear them, but I wasn't sure if I'd be able to lift my leg high enough for you to see the socks. So they've got Persian pigs all the way down the side, and they've got Persian pigs written across the bottom. I don't know if you can see that. Five pairs of Persian pigs. Three years too late, because I remember I told you I've gone off Persian pigs. Remember I told you that recently? I used to love Persian pigs, and now I'm just not that fussed about them anymore, because I've found other things I... I like even more than Percy pigs. But you know, there's something really, really sad that can happen to people, that that can happen with Jesus as well. That people love Jesus, maybe when they're young, like you, and you're going to Sunday school, and you love Jesus, and yet you get older, and there's other things you start loving, and you don't love Jesus as much. You're not that fussed about Jesus. Well, today in the Bible, we're going to be looking at a passage that reminds us that Jesus is coming back. He's coming back at the end of the world, and he wants to find people that love him. He says, be ready for that day. So I hope if you love Jesus today, I hope you keep on loving him. And whatever other things in the world, good things, that we like them, that we never put these things or make them more important than Jesus. Always love him first, and then love God all the other good things that he gives us. Let's do the Lord's Prayer together then. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again this time from Psalm 34 on page 40. Psalm 34 on page 40. If you're feeling it warm and you're near a window, 
If it's not open already, you can open it. <clears throat> Psalm 34 on page 40. We're going to sing from verse 11. From verse 11 down to verse 18. Bottom of page 40. Come here, my children. Gather round and listen to my word. And I will help you understand how you may fear the Lord. This is verses for children. Verses 11 to 18 of Psalm 34. Let's stand if you're able. We're going to read God's Word from the Gospel according to Matthew and chapter 24. You'll find this on page 993 if you've got a church Bible. Matthew chapter 24. We're looking today at the return of Jesus at the end of the world. So we're going to break into the chapter at verse 30. Take up a reading at verse 30 and read to the end of the chapter. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 at verse 30. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away 
until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. <clears throat> who then is faithful? Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom the Master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, My master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen. This is the word of God, and we trust and pray that he'll follow it with his blessing. Let's bow our heads again in a word of prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, we've been reminded uh, there in that reading of a servant who became complacent because his master was taking a long time to come back. And we know, Lord, that that is a, a picture, that is an illustration for us of those who become complacent about your return at the end of the world. Forgive us, Lord, if that's us, if because life has become so comfortable for us that we're not longing for you to come. But help us, Lord, to remember and to learn that you could come at any moment. And when that moment happens, that that everything that we give our time and our talents to in this world, that's all worthless. All that will matter on that day is what we have done with Jesus. So Lord, we pray that we would not have neglected you, but that we will be actively following and serving you, that we will be found ready when Christ returns. We thank you, Lord, for every person here today. We thank you for bringing us together. We thank you that you put it in our hearts to be here. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless us. And we pray that you would bless uh, those in our congregation and in our community who have uh, particular needs, Lord. Uh, we all need you, but there are times and situations in our lives where we're more aware uh, than others and other times of that need. And so we want to commit to you, Lord, those who grieve. We pray that you would comfort them as you alone are able. We pray for those who are sick, Lord. We pray for those who may be anxious, for those who may be depressed, for those who are lonely, uh, for those who are sick. Lord, we commit all these to you and ask that you would draw alongside any who have specific needs. Uh, we want to pray for the situation in Sky today, Lord, following uh, the awful events there uh, this week. We pray for the families involved. We pray, Lord, for those who grieve. And we pray uh, for those who've been injured and who are in hospital. And we pray, Lord, for those traumatized uh, by uh, these incidents, Lord, that you would help them, that you would help that community. We pray for the emergency services, Lord. We thank you for them and pray for them and the things that they have to deal with. And we remember, Lord, those who, who, who pastor or who uh, are counseling people in these difficult situations when it is uh, hard to find words. We pray for those preaching in sky today uh, and we commit them to you, Lord. And we ask that you, 
uh, would help that community and that island uh, through this particularly distressing uh, time uh, for them. Uh, here, Lord, we pray for our children. We've prayed for them already, but as schools go back, we pray uh, for any of the children who may be anxious or worried about going back. We pray for those who will be starting school, that you would help them and take care of them. We pray for those uh, moving from primary to secondary. We pray, Lord, that they would make good friends, friends who would, who would be a, a good influence on their lives. Bless our children, Lord. Bless those who teach them as well. We pray that the influence that they have in the lives of our young people would be used uh, for good. And as we pray for those who are young, we remember, Lord, those who are elderly as well with the uh, new challenges that come, Lord, with advancing years. Uh, we pray for those confined to their homes. We pray for those in care homes. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that we're uh, able to be back in, uh, in Nishmore Care Home. We pray for the service there this afternoon. We pray for the residents and the staff, Lord, that you would bless them and that you would help them and, and, and all involved in the care of others, whether it's, whether it's at home, in hospital, or in some kind of uh, care home, Lord, that you would be with them. We want to thank you as well, Lord, for the meeting we had uh, this week with uh, the Free Church continuing. We thank you for the spirit of that meeting and, and, and the discussion that we had. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to go ahead of us as we seek to resolve uh, the issue of the property there. So be with us, Lord. Bless us as a congregation. Be with Andrew, our assistant minister, uh, who's on holiday. Be with him as he returns this week. We pray that he will be refreshed. And we ask, Lord, that you be with himself uh, and Ailey and Isla. Bless them in their home life and provide for their every need. Be with us now, Lord. Lead us into your truth as we turn to it shortly to study it together. <coughs> give us an understanding of it and give us uh, an understanding of how it applies to us and what it means to each one of us. All these things we ask, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll uh, sing once again, <clears throat> this time from Psalm 11 on page 13. <clears throat> sing Psalms 11. On page 13 in your psalm books, and we're going to sing from verse 3 to the end of the psalm. If the foundations are destroyed and all around there is decay, whatever can the righteous do surrounded by such disarray? From verse 3 eh, to verse 7, to God's praise. If the foundations are destroyed
we seek the Lord's help, can we turn in our Bibles to the passage that we read, Matthew chapter 24, and we can read again verse 42. Matthew chapter 24, page 994. And let's read again verse 42. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. You do not know on what day your Lord will come. If you ever ask Google or Alexa, I suppose, when will the world end? Uh, you'll get a whole array of different dates, different predictions. Lots of these dates, particularly if you search the internet, they have come and gone. An American uh, evangelist who had his own radio program, a man called Harold Camping, he had a huge following. And he stated categorically that the world would end on October 21st, 2011 at precisely 6 p.m. Many of his followers were so convinced that they gave up their jobs, they sold their houses, and they put their money into a campaign to tell people to be ready for this date. I, I can actually remember coming across a sermon once that was entitled, Why Camping is Wrong. And I was intrigued. I thought, what's wrong with going out in a tent and for an overnight? Turns out it was about this fellow, this false teacher, Harold Camping, who duped many people into believing that the world would end on this particular date at this particular time. Of course, it didn't. Camping, actually, he later apologized, and he admitted that his critics were right and that nobody knows when the world will end. And that's exactly what Jesus says here in verse 36. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son but only the Father. So we don't know when. What we do know is the world will end. And it'll end when Jesus returns uh, to, to judge the world. And in this passage, no less than Jesus himself, warns us, appeals to us to be ready because it will be too late to prepare when he comes. Verse 44 says, So you also must be ready. You must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So I want to uh, look at the return of Jesus today from this passage under three headings. I want to talk about confusion, clarity, and counsel. These will be our three headings. Confusion, clarity, and counsel. So confusion, first of all, today. This chapter that we read, we didn't read all of it, and we didn't read all of it because it's a confusing chapter, Matthew 24. Bible scholars have argued over it for centuries, and that is because it appears that Jesus says in this passage, even in the verses that we read, it appears that Jesus is saying this world will end before the generation living at the time had passed. So we didn't read the whole of the chapter, but we did read that verse. So, for instance, if you turn back a page of you using the church Bible, he, he is talking and he's been talking about the end of the world and about his return. Uh, so verse 27, for instance, if you have your Bible open and you can see verse 27. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So he's talking there clearly about his return at the end of the world. But then go down to verse, well, verse 34 is the difficult verse, but I'll read from verse 32. Verse 32, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it's near, right at the door. And this is the verse. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Right. It does seem to be a problem, that verse. Did Jesus really believe that the world would end 
within a generation. Well, if so, people say he was either confused or he was wrong, and therefore, can we trust anything that he said? So the argument goes. Well, <clears throat> to understand it, you need to rewind right to the very start of the chapter. Please look at it with me, uh, verses 1 uh, to 3. And, and it's only there we start to grasp what's going on here. And, and in, in these verses, we actually find the disciples are confused. So there's people who are confused about this chapter. There's some who say Jesus was confused. Certainly in verses 1 to 3, we find the disciples are uh, confused. Let me read 1 to 3. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things he asked? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So let me, let me just break it up. Verse 1, the disciples are saying to Jesus, look at these wonderful buildings. Look at that great architecture of the temple. Verse 2, Jesus says, none of it will be left. There won't be a stone left on top of another. This will all be destroyed. Verse 3, they then say, when's that going to happen? And when are you coming back at the end of the world? You see, that question shows they're confused. Because they believe that all these things are going to happen at the same time. The temple's going to be destroyed at the time that Jesus returns and the world ends. Now, that's not the case. These are two different events, the destruction of the temple and the end of the world. So in the verses that follow, Jesus goes on to talk about both. He's talking about when the temple will be destroyed, and he's talking about when the world will end. But as you read it, it's difficult for us to be crystal clear of when he's talking about one and when he's talking about the other. So that's what makes this chapter confusing. So I want to just draw your attention to some verses where it's, it's clear he's talking about one thing and another verse where he's clear about that he's talking about the other thing. So in verse 34, that problem verse, when he says, I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. He's answering that first question then. When will the temple be destroyed? When will this happen? It happened in AD 70. That's when the temple was destroyed, when most of the generation that were there at the time were still living. So that's what verse 34 is about. Verse 36, though, is different. Verse 36, he says, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. He's talking there about the end of the world. Some versions actually, some translations make it clearer that he's talking about something else, just the way they, they, they word it. So verse 36 begins, but about that day, he's talking about a different day now, but about that day, no one knows when that will be. So verse 34, Jesus is saying the temple will be destroyed while this generation are still living. Verse 36, he's saying, but the end of the world, nobody knows when that will come. And probably the clearest evidence that he cannot be talking about the end of the world in verse 34 and saying it's going to happen within this generation is that he tells us in verse 36 that even he doesn't know, not even the Son knows, when the world will end. So if he didn't know, he could not be saying two verses earlier, the world's going to end within a generation. So there is confusion and we can understand why there's confusion. But God's word is clear, nevertheless. The disciples, they ask him at the start. They say, when's the temple going to be destroyed and the world going to end? Thinking they're all going to happen simultaneously. And Jesus goes on to explain and to say to them, well, one's going to happen in your lifetime. But the other, God alone knows when that will take place. So that's our first point today, confusion. There is confusion. Go home and, and read the chapter. It is hard to work out 
when he's talking about one thing and when he's talking about the other. But he's answering two questions that they asked, although they thought it was just one question. So confusion, first of all. Secondly, though, I want to come to clarity. Clarity. While there is quite a lot in this chapter that can be difficult, the statement Jesus makes about when the world will end is crystal clear. He says, nobody knows that but God. Verse 36, one more time. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Let me deal first of all with the fact that he, Jesus, the Son of God, says, I don't know when the world will end. And I remember coming across this when I was fairly young. I'm thinking, how, how can that be? How can Jesus, who is equal with God, not know what God knows? Well, when Jesus, when God the Son took on humanity, so when Jesus came into this world, he humbled himself. Philippians 2 tells us he became a servant. Now, he never stopped being God, okay? He did not stop being God. He humbled himself not by becoming less, but by adding to his Godhead humanity. And that was a humbling for God to become man. But he never stopped being God. What he did do was he chose not to draw on all his divine attributes, on all his divine power. So there are things that are true about God that, that Jesus never chose to be true of him. So for instance, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere, all of the time. Jesus wasn't omnipresent. God is omniscient. He knows everything. Jesus chose not to know everything. Okay? And that's how, that's why the Bible says that he he grew in, in knowledge, he grew in wisdom. If he knew everything, there was no way Jesus could have grown. But when he became a man, when he humbled himself and took on humanity, he chose not to draw on all his divine powers. So he was, he was, he, he was not omniscient. He didn't know everything, okay? So Jesus didn't know when the world would end. He tells us the angels don't know when the world would end, and neither do we. No mere human knows that. Now, I've called this point clarity because Jesus makes very clear that he will return. He will return. But he also makes very clear that nobody knows when that will be. Nobody but God. So every time you hear a date mentioned for the end of the world, you can be absolutely certain that that is just a fabrication of someone's imagination. They've made it up. They've made it up. So there's, there's clarity about the fact that he will return. Jesus is coming back. Now, in, in, in a future sermon, hopefully not too far down the line, God willing, I hope to deal with why the delay. Why has he not come back after 2,000 years? And the Bible actually gives us an answer to that. It tells us why there's a delay in his coming back. And hopefully we'll talk about that in a few weeks' time. But, but he is coming back. And when he comes back, he's coming to end the world and he's coming to judge the people in it. And although we don't know the timing, he says nobody knows the timing, he does tell us some things about what it will be like when he comes. And he gives us three pictures between here and the end of the chapter that I want to just consider very, very briefly today. Three pictures that tell us what it's going to be like when he comes. So the first is this, it'll be like Noah's day. Verse 38. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. It'll be like Noah's day. Now, Noah's day, the people were incredibly wicked. That's why God brought the flood and destroyed the world. But the emphasis here is not so much on the fact that that there'll be great wickedness at the time. The emphasis is on the fact that it comes unexpectedly. It's going to come suddenly. It says here, they, they didn't know it. 
They didn't know. Now, there was, they should have known it. The Bible tells that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He took 120 years building the ark. They had plenty of warnings, but they chose to totally ignore that. Totally ignore it. And when the flood came, it came so unexpectedly. The Bible says it took them away. It took them away. What was going on at the time? It was just business as usual, you could call it. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage. None of these things bad in themselves. They're all legitimate pleasures. It was just life goes on. Business as usual. And then all of a sudden, bang, it was all over. The flood came and took them away. Took them away. That's all it says. Just a few words. And that was it. That was the end for these people. What was the mistake they made? The mistake they made was that they were, they were enjoying the good things that God gave them and ignoring the best thing that God was offering them. All the things they were enjoying were good things, gifts from God, eating, drinking, money. But they ignored the fact that God promised eternal life to all who will trust him. You know, that can be the case with us as well. We're not bad people. We're not wicked in one sense. We're just enjoying life, enjoying the gifts God has given us, but forgetting that these gifts will one day end and that we've not done anything about the better thing he's offering us, eternal life in Jesus Christ. So it'll be like the day of Noah, Jesus says. That's how it's going to be. It's unexpected. But then secondly, he tells us it'll come like a thief in the night. Uh, verse 43. And the, and the point of this picture is that it will be unpredictable. Verse 43. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. He would have kept watch. The arrival of a thief is going to be unpredictable. And when the thief comes, he's, he's going to take what's most valuable. He's going to have to pick and choose. A thief is not going to go around your whole house taking everything. He's going to look for these high-value items. And that's what he's going to take. And the return of Jesus is the same. He's going to take what's most valuable, what is most precious. And what is that? Well, the Bible tells us what is most precious, that it's your soul, that it's your soul that will be lost if you're not ready for Jesus to return. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? He'll come like a thief. The timing is unpredictable. So Jesus is telling us in pictures what it's going to be like. He's saying the return, it's going to be unexpected was the first picture. It's going to be unpredictable, was the second picture. And the third is that it's going to be irreversible. From verse 45 down to the end of the chapter. It's like a master who executes judgment. So in, in, the, in these verses, I don't have time to read them all, but the master, he's been away for a long time, and the servant that he's set in charge, he starts to think he's never coming back. It's been so long. And so he starts playing up. He, he, he becomes violent, and he's eating, and he's getting drunk. Verse um, 49, there's no verse, yeah, verse 49, I think it is. He begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. And his master comes back unexpectedly, and he brings immediate judgment on this servant. Verse 51. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus is saying, that's how it's going to be. That's how it's going to be when I return. His punishment will be swift and it'll be final. It will be irreversible. There will be no 
opportunity for appeal. There will be no time to repent or change one's ways. This is irreversible. So the return of Jesus, and this is what he's telling us, and this is the clarity. He says, nobody knows when it will be, but this is what it's going to be like. It's going to be unexpected. It's going to be unpredictable. And it's going to be irreversible. So what do we do? How do we respond to that? How do we prepare for that? Well, that brings us to our final point. We've seen confusion. We've seen clarity. Finally, counsel. Jesus counsels us two things. In verse 42, to be watchful, therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. And in verse 44, to be ready, so you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. The advice to be ready is for those who are unsaved. The advice to be watchful is for those who are saved. The Christian must be watchful. The Christian ought to be living every day as if Jesus could come back that day. And for many of us, I suspect that's not the case. And we possibly give little thought to the fact that Jesus could come at any moment. And we don't live like he could come back today. Lord Shaftesbury, he was a, a great social reformer who lived in the 1800s. And he said on one occasion, he said this, I do not think that in the last 40 years I have ever lived one conscious hour that was not influenced by the thought of our Lord's return. His whole life was influenced by that fact that Jesus could come back at any time. And that is probably why he did so much good. Lord Shaftesbury did a huge amount of work among the poor. And he also gave massive support to foreign missions. Because he lived as if Jesus could return at any time. And you know, if we lived with that outlook and that thought in our minds, I suspect we would be much more active in the service of God than we are. I suspect you'd be more likely to leave this place and go and talk to someone about Jesus and to warn them that he could come. He could come today. Bishop J.C. Ryle, speaking about the return of Jesus, he said this. He said, the world will not be converted when Christ returns. Instead, he said, millions who profess to be Christians will be found thoughtless, unbelieving, godless, Christless, worldly, unfit to meet their judge. He's talking about people who profess to be Christians that show by their life that they clearly aren't. And then he poses this question, will you be one of those who perishes in the judgment? Or will you be ready and waiting when Christ returns? What did Jesus say? Verse 44. He said, so you, you also must be ready. You know, as kids, when we played hide and seek, whenever you heard, ready or not, here I come, usually you had a few seconds just to make sure that you were safely hidden. But you know, when Jesus returns, there's not even seconds to get ready. It's too late. It's too late. That's why Jesus says, so you also must be ready. You must be ready. C.S. Lewis, in his book, and I'm almost done, The Screwtape Letters, he, 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 he recounts his imaginary scene where where Satan is discussing strategy with, with three uh, apprentices, you could say. And, and, and one of them says to Satan, well, I'm going to tell people there's no heaven. And Satan says, well, that won't work. They know that's, they, they won't believe that. They know that's not true. And so the next says, well, I'm going to tell them there's no hell. And Satan says, nah, they, 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 they won't believe that either. And the third says, well, I'm going to tell them there's no hurry. 
There's no hurry. And Satan said, you will gain many souls. You see, that's, that's Satan's greatest argument. There's no rush. There is no hurry. And you know, when he whispers that in your ear today, you remember what Jesus said. He said, therefore, you also must be ready. Must be ready. He didn't say, you need to go and get ready. He says, you must be ready now. You know, some of you maybe have been thinking about the need to get ready. You may have been thinking about that for a long time. Thinking about becoming a Christian. Thinking, I, I, I need to get ready. And maybe today this, this sermon has caused you to think about it some more. Maybe you, you plan to go home and, and, and you're going to think about it. What if Christ returns before you get home? Before you reach home. He's telling us he could come anytime. It will be sudden. Unpredictable. Irreversible. Ask the Lord to save you right here and now. Before you leave this building. Because that's what Jesus says. Therefore, you must be ready. And if you are ready, if you're a Christian today, then keep watch and live as if Jesus could return at any moment. Because that's what he tells us. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will return. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have given us today. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. That right here and now we are on mercy's ground. We still have opportunity to repent and trust Jesus. But there is nothing more guaranteed than now. Help us, Lord, to put our trust in you if we've never done so before. To do so before we leave this building. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing in conclusion in Psalm 96a on page 127. Page 127. Psalm 96a at verse 7. Singing to the end of the psalm. Verse 7, all nations to the Lord ascribe the glory that is due. Glory and strength ascribe to God and praise his name anew. From verse 7 to the end of the psalm. Let's stand if you're able.
Now may grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>